As you stand in the Sistine Chapel and look towards the altar, you find that the whole wall has been dissolved into a nightmare pictorial extension of the long, tall hall of the chapel. No frame comforts you with the feeling that this is only a painting. The vision doesn't offer interesting costume or props. There's no enticing landscape to wander in. The setting is a desolate terrain. Blue space, chunky thunderous clouds. Human shapes, naked, striving, embracing, entangled, float and entwine in the foreground. They seem to burst through the wall into the chapel. The world has ended. The awful reality of the last judgment is taking place. Human souls rise naked from the grave. We're drawn in with sympathy for the human feelings written so forcibly in the torrent of emotions and gestures. There are realizations and fears we have never as yet experienced. Small figures and gigantic ones fill the entangled foreground. The rules of perspective need no longer apply. Time has ended. There's tremendous excitement, no repose. At first sight, the effect is of confusion. It's not tidily stratified for the easy consumption of the viewer. Then the turbulence begins to resolve into a pattern, a pattern of four strata. Against this horizontal organization of bands is a swirling circular movement. Pivoting around the trumpeting angels, the souls rise on the left and fall on the right. Above, in the top two bands, figures sweep towards Christ into a central group, while vast crowds seem to withdraw to the edges, preoccupied in the revelation of a new life. These are powerful images. But how can we find out more about their meaning to the 16th century spectator? To understand them further, I want to look at the rest of the decoration in the Pope's private chapel. Let's begin in the 1480s, when the building of this huge barn-like hall was completed. Between 1481 and 82, a large team of artists painted the decoration of these walls up to this level in three bands or tiers. In the middle band, over the altar here, they did an altarpiece of the Assumption of the Virgin. Then on the left hand wall, they told the story of Moses, beginning on the altar wall and reading towards the door. Then. On the right-hand side, they told the story of Christ, beginning again on the altar wall with the nativity and reading towards the door. Then above, between the windows, they painted a series of portraits of the popes. Now, everything on the altar wall that had been done in the 1480s was taken off uh, to make way for the Last Judgment. But earlier, between 1508 and 12, Michelangelo, as a young man, had painted the spaces above the windows and the vault. On the vault, he told the stories of the creation and the story of Noah. Let's look at this huge scheme in biblical sequence and try to read it from the 16th century point of view. Above the altar, Michelangelo painted the creation. God creates the world, the sun and moon, man and woman. But 
man falls from paradise and God causes the flood. Noah sacrifices to God in thanksgiving for being saved. But he too is imperfect. and he's discovered by his sons, drunken and naked. Man has proved sinful, but the prophets and sibyls were symbols of hope to the 16th century spectator. In their utterances, it was believed there were prophecies of the coming of Christ. In line with tradition, Michelangelo divided his ceiling into compartments but he employed an extremely original architectural frame. In the scenes represented, we see the sculptor's obsession with the human figure as a vehicle of emotional expression. Landscapes are minimal, the naked human form telling the story. The slumping shape of Noah, the tension of his sons. Each figure projects its particular mood often in an exaggerated way, to impress the spectator far below. With the story of Moses, there is new hope for man. Signorelli shows Moses reading God's law to his people. He sets his scene in an idyllic landscape. The costumes are flecked with gold leaf. The colors are bright and decorative and the subordinate events are conveniently staged on obliging landscape features. In the foreground, the biblical events are attended by a mixture of modern spectators and exotic figures a l'antica, the female figure carrying a child with attendant putti and a male nude, the type of classicizing figure which was to be taken up and developed by Michelangelo on the ceiling. Opposite the Moses story, on the right, we move forward in history to the life of Christ. Again, there's hope for man. Perugino's baptism is refined and elegant. The elongated figures with their twisting poses are set in an ideal and harmonious landscape. With Christ's charge to St. Peter, we move into the more recent era of the church. St. Peter is given charge of the church on earth initiating the succession of popes. And it's not surprising to find a rank of canonized popes making up the band of decoration between the windows. So the chapel presented a neat, reassuring theme. The history of mankind, the teaching of the Old and the New Testaments, and the handing over of authority to a long line of popes. But in 1535, Michelangelo and Paul III tore out the first chapters in this decorative, coherent program. And they did so in a mood of piety, which has got a lot to do with the Counter-Reformation. There's nothing comforting about this. The story of man jumps into the future a future that was expected to become present at any time. No one will be secure until he's judged. There's no place for the lyrical landscapes of a signorelli. The world will be destroyed. Contemporary criticism was mixed. On the upper part of the wall, we see groups of angels in rare and lovely poses. They carry the cross of the Son of God, the sponge and the crown of thorns, and the nails and column where he was whipped. These things are thrown in the teeth of those who ignore God, but give comfort and faith to the good. A speaker in one of Giulio's dialogues was not so enthusiastic. There was no need to make the group all twisting and turning as if performing a dance. 
Such forcefulness would suit laborers and gymnasts better than angels, who are celestial spirits. This critic would have preferred Traini's earlier interpretation at Pisa. Serene angels carry the symbols of the passion. Though Christ is seated, the pose has much in common with Michelangelo's figure, who seems to be in the process of standing up. Another speaker from Giglio's dialogues explained. Christ stands up to pronounce the horrible sentence on the dam. His right arm is lifted as if to hurl the sinners from him, while his left arm seems to embrace the blessed lovingly. But a month after the fresco was unveiled, Sernini reported. Some say that by portraying Christ without a beard and making him too young, he lacks the proper majesty. Possibly they were thinking of a more traditional type of representation, like Giotto's painting in Padua. Seated on his throne of justice is a bearded Christ of a type established by the Byzantine tradition. The Virgin was the subject of heated discussion in Giglio's dialogues as well. Another caprice is that he has represented the Virgin timorous and full of fear, as if she did not feel herself quite secure against the wrath of God and had to hide herself. I think that was only done to show us that she is the mother of all mercifulness, and her fearfulness indicates how much she hates the severity of the judgment. Traini's virgin on her separate throne might have pleased the first speaker more. Surrounding Christ and the virgin is a group of martyrs and saints. They jostle close to him, talking and gesticulating. St. Peter raises the keys, again a reference to the church on earth. Opposite him is Adam. St. Lawrence heaves up the grill on which he was roasted. St. Bartholomew brandishes the knife with which he was flayed and dangles his skin with his other hand. There is great agitation. They're amazed to see Christ face to face and they may also be fearful of the full discussion of their sins which would precede their enjoyment of heaven. Martyrs thrust out the instruments of their torture. St. Catherine with her wheel, St. Blaise with the carding cones, St. Sebastian. Above this group, there's even greater excitement. People embrace. They must be souls who've been in heaven or purgatory. Now, for the first time since their death, they've received their bodies again. At last they can express their bliss physically. Is it not ridiculous to have imagined amongst the multitude of blessed souls in heaven some who tenderly kiss one another? Should they not rather be intent on God? We are not to suppose that the beatified are really kissing one another. Rather, in their most ardent love of God, they all love one another. And Michelangelo could not have chosen a better way of expressing this than by kissing. The trumpet-blowing angels announcing the Last Judgment carry two books, Revelations. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Below the angels is a cavern but the fresco is damaged here, and it's difficult to see what it is. If we look at a copy, an early copy by Venusti, it becomes clearer. This is the fire of the first judgment, through which the souls of those still alive on judgment day must pass. Angels pull out the worthy ones, who join the dead rising from their graves. The tombs open at the sound of the trumpets, and out come human beings in a great variety of marvellous attitudes. 
Some, as described by the prophet Ezekiel, have only their bones joined together. Some are partly clothed in flesh, others totally. Some are naked, others are clothed in shrouds or winding sheets. Some dive or climb through the air enthusiastically. Others are helped up in an ecstasy of passivity and humility. This brings to mind the words of St. Paul. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Some of the saints look downwards, witnessing a fierce battle. Angels beat down the proud and insolent sinners who are trying to fight their way out of hell. Dragged down by devils, some of these figures seem to represent the seven deadly sins. We can pick out, for instance, the avaricious man by his money bag. The sinners are pulled down by evil spirits, the proud by his hair, the lusty by his most shameful parts, and appropriately each vice by that part with which he sinned. Dolce grew prudish about one of the figures. Whatever mystical significance can be hidden in the sight of a devil grabbing the testicles of a huge figure who bites his finger at the pain. The idea is a tumultuous interpretation of scenes already devised by Signorelli at Orvieto. Signorelli also represented Charon from pagan mythology, the ferryman who rowed the dead across the river Acheron to Hades. Michelangelo filled Charon's boat with sinners. The image recalls Dante's Inferno. A boat shot forth, whose white-haired boatman old, bald as he came, woe to the wicked, woe! Never you hope to look on heaven. Behold, I come to ferry you hence across the tide to endless night, fierce fires and shramming cold. Our infernal ferryman of the livid wash, only his flame-ringed eyeballs rolled a glower. But those naked souls, how gash and pale they grew, chattering their teeth for dread, when first they felt his harsh tongue's cruel lash. Care on his eyes red like a burning brand, thumps with his oar the lingerers the delay. Contemporaries recognized Michelangelo's reference to Virgil's description of the underworld in the figure of the Prince of Hell, Minos. In an age when people believed that the Last Judgment could really happen any day, the details would have been continually impressed upon them by sermons, paintings and sculpture. Michelangelo could depend on this knowledge. Although Giotto's painting of about 1300 is calmly composed in hierarchical bands, the general layout is much the same as Michelangelo's composition. Earlier, mosaics like those on the island of Torcello show how little the scheme had changed since the 12th century. And Florentines would have been only too familiar with this mosaic in their own baptistry. In most of these representations, the spectator can identify the characters portrayed. In Fra Angelico's panel, we have the fun of spotting David, and John the Evangelist, and St. Paul, and so on. We're given clear attributes to identify the personalities in the historical portrait gallery. Among the blessed, we find the cardinal, the nun, the monk, the soldier, and similarly, 
among the sinners. In Michelangelo's design, we can identify very few of the figures, ten or so out of hundreds. The viewer is left for the most part to make up his or her own mind exactly what kinds of people will be saved. Michelangelo did not wish to observe the common usage of making angels with wings and demons black with long tails and horns. And that does not please me, for one cannot easily tell the one from the other. Confusing, perhaps, but how true to life. Still, Michelangelo's demons with their long ears and sometimes reptilian shape and little horns are distant cousins of those in earlier representations. Michelangelo showers us with detail, not of different attributes or of props and costume, but of masses of individuals' emotional reactions. He gives us a vivid feeling of a huge crowd, of every man and woman that ever lived. More than anything else, Counter-Reformation critics were infuriated by the rampant nudity of the design. Pius V soon had the most offending bits of nakedness painted over. We can see the effect Michelangelo and Paul III intended in Marcello Venusti's copy. Domenici defended Michelangelo. We find it written that in ancient times people went about naked. This custom, along with many others, has been negligently allowed to lapse to our great loss. Michelangelo, in his marvelous painting in the chapel in Rome, enthusiastically returns to this custom. What he has done cannot ever be praised enough by the experts. But they cannot completely crush those ignorant hypocrites who think it shameful to gaze at the most beautiful parts of the body in both sexes. Painters, including the pious Frangelico, had always shown the damned naked, utterly vulnerable and robbed of all pride, that sin which was considered the root of vice. The bodies of the newly resurrected were also usually naked, as in this relief by Maitani on the front of Orvieto Cathedral. but the blessed tended to be more properly dressed. However, Luca Signorelli, appealing to the taste for classicizing nude poses, showed the blessed naked in his fresco in the same cathedral. But draperies are strategically placed. Signorelli's nudes are beautiful and decorative contributing to an ideal and reassuring vision of the rewards of heaven. But Michelangelo's nudes have a quite different function. He uses the whole of their bodies to express their human character and emotions. That wide range of feelings, from ecstasy to horror, which would become a reality on the Judgment Day. <laughs> 